Think about it, the condition the world's in right now. It says, with the world at a financial and flu fever pitch. Aren't you thankful that Jesus is watching over you? Watching over us, and he's coming soon. I didn't hear a loud enough amen to that. <laughs> amen, he's coming soon. There are angels hovering round. That's another very important thought. We have guardian angels with us, 24-7, 365, right? And the Holy Spirit's working in us as we pray day by day, throughout the day. We have nothing to fear for the future except fear itself. You've heard that somewhere before in your history classes probably. So our Lord Jesus told a parable while he was watching a farmer sowing seed. A sower went out to sow. The plants began to grow, but when he came to mow, his friends all wanted to know. Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? Well, he said to them, what? What did it say? An enemy has done this. That's our problem. There's an enemy out there. Revelation tells us that story. In Revelation chapter 12, it tells us about this war between good and evil. It started in heaven, of all places. Many of you are familiar with that. The angels rebelled, one third of them, they tell us. One third of the angels chose to follow Satan. Well, the fallen angels were expelled from heaven and they fell to here, unfortunately. Right now we've prayed that the holy angels will be around the building, inside the walls here, to protect us from those evil influences. Now you can choose to let your mind wander and get away from the good influence of the holy angels. But that's a choice we make. Are we going to focus on the word of God, on the love of God, on the sweetness of Jesus? Or are we going to let our minds be under the influence of the Holy Spirit? It's a choice that we make. I shared at prayer meeting the other night a story. Our son Boaz and his wife, Lorraine, are in the mission field, have been self-supporting, and they're in Senegal now. Lorraine's sister is a pastor's wife in Oregon. And her husband recently was holding an evangelistic series. Some of you have heard this before, but for those who haven't, she felt impressed that she needed, during the evangelistic meetings while her husband was preaching, that she would pray. Well, she did. But unfortunately, much to her chagrin, nobody joined her, although she invited the church to come and pray with her. So she prayed there by herself the first night of the meeting. And she was concerned, but hopeful, that the next night some others would join her in the room. And I pick up the story in this paragraph that she sent out just a month or so ago. And it reads like this. Sabbath evening, I was praying by myself again. I felt a bit more discouraged. I put on a beautiful rendition of the Lord's Prayer. While it played, I prayed... While it played, I prayed, I know that where two or three are gathered together in your name, you are there, Lord. But what if it's just me and there aren't two or three? When the song finished, I opened my eyes after the prayer and the room was full of angels. I started crying as I looked around the room in amazement. The angels were tall, as tall as a ceiling, broad shoulders. They stood shoulder to shoulder with their backs to the wall around the edge of the room. I felt tiny compared to them. They had wings and were, had flowing robe-like clothes. I was drawn to their faces. They looked like men, very handsome men. Their eyes were so kind and they smiled, gentle, comforting smiles. Their facial features were defined and they had a warrior-like atmosphere of boldness and holiness about them. Their dark hair flowed down to their shoulders and they looked almost iridescent. While I couldn't see through them, I almost could. Their forms shone with yellow-white color. I was only able to see them for four or five seconds 
and then they were gone. But I couldn't stop crying for the rest of the evening. How close is heaven to earth now? Are there angels really around us? God is at work in powerful ways all around the world. Think about what's going on with the angels that were expelled from heaven. They're following Lucifer, who now, his name meant light bearer as Lucifer, but he's now Satan, the adversary, the accuser, accusing God as being as selfish as himself. Hard to believe. How art, thou fall, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? For thou hast said in thine heart, from Isaiah, hast said in thine heart, I will ascend to heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will sit also on the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High. Wow, the boldness of that. So why do bad things happen? on planet Earth? Why does death stalk both good and evil throughout our lives? There's an enemy. Ask Job. Familiar with the book of Job in the Bible? At least we know the backstory behind that because it's spelled out for us, but Job didn't know it. Job found out that it's not useful to argue with people who join the adversary. His three friends, it wasn't helpful to argue with them. After all, they're accusing him of being a sinner. We should already know that, <laughs> that we're sinners. But praise the Lord, we're forgiven, cleansed, transformed by the grace of God under the power of the Holy Spirit as we pray. Hallelujah! Is that good news? Unfortunately, we remain in this planet that's in rebellion against God. Until we've grown, think of the plants, until we have grown through storm and sunshine, through drought and dew, through curse and blessing, until we live through those experiences, we won't be fully mature for the harvest because that's what we're waiting for, to be ripe grain for the harvest. And we have to go through those cycles of life. So the earth also was what? Corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with what? This is our condition. We're living in this planet. In the days of Noah, rebellion and rejection of the love and grace and mercy of God reached a peak. So God looked upon the earth. What does that mean to look? God's going into a judgment, right? He's looking throughout the earth to see what's going on. Is he doing that now? If you studied your Sabbath school lesson, what did you find last week, this week? It's talking about the judgment. So it's certainly true that God looked judgment time. The prophet Daniel wrote down what had been revealed to him. This judgment would exonerate God, the one that's taking place that we're living in that time right now. If you're not sure about that, be sure to study the Sabbath school lesson. Ask one of us for it and we'll find a pride one for you. They're available online too. How is God going to be exonerated? What is he going to do? How is he going to solve that problem? Well, he's making it clear through the sanctuary service in the Old Testament and then through Jesus' ministry in the New Testament because we can see God's character when we follow and trace Jesus' life about his ministry, about his unselfish, loving revelation of the character of God. Well, as it says in Genesis chapter 6, which we had for our scripture reading, then the Lord saw, what's that again? Another statement of judgment, right? He saw, he's looking, he's examining lives to see what's going on. The Bible defines wickedness, and it's judgment time about wickedness. It was great. The truth is that God loves us, and he wants to rescue us from sin. That's his goal for us. He wants to take us away from the suffering and the selfishness that's here and the challenges that we faced. It's very exciting to know that it's very simple. Our challenge is to love who? Love God, with your heart, mind, soul, and spirit, and love. This is simple stuff, right? Not complicated. 
That's the goal. That's the whole duty of man, you could say. Unfortunately, every, when he studied what's going on, he saw that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only what? Evil, how often? And where's that coming from? Pollution is pouring into the world endlessly through the media, through all kinds of ways, tempting us to vicariously participate in sin. Because if we are led to think lustful thoughts, think, think hatred toward other people, Jesus said we're already engaged in the sin. Now that's tragic to think that this is what's going on, evil continually. And the media is lying to us about the character of God. An angry God, a hellfire God, lies from the pit of hell. Think about the kingdom of God for a minute with me. It has a very simple charter. It says here, the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. The simple charter, the Ten Commandments. Remember the preamble. The covenant is the preamble then with the Ten Commandments, right? So what does the preamble say? It says, I am the Lord thy God that brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. Sin is a place of bondage. And God brought the Israelites out of Egypt, even though we were, they were sinful people. But he loved them that much. Does he love us that much? Does he want to bring us out of the bondage of sin? We have to turn off the pollution and focus in on God and his love for us. The simple fact of the Ten Commandments is that they're all designed because it's part of God's kingdom of love, the way his kingdom of love operates. Now, we should see, as they needed to see, how much God loves us so that we would fall in love with him. That's the exciting thought. The Ten Commandments we should see as a wall of protection to keep us from the destructive nature of sin. It's from Eve we could learn that sin leads to what? God said it would lead to death, right? Eat the fruit, you die. He didn't want that, he didn't like that, but it's the way it operates. Unfortunately, you know, evil, Eve, first with the evil, and the opposite of death is to live, evil, and live. They're the opposites. Mirror images, reversed letters. Amazing. God wants us to turn from evil so we can live. I'm going to do something with the, uh, this video clip for a minute because when it, this text reads, the Lord was sorry he'd made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. This is hard for us to get our mind around because we can see God is angry with us. We can see the angry parent that wants to beat you into submission. But I want to sow a different picture in your mind. Can you hear a father and a mother's love saying, I'm so sorry my children are so messed up and they're in pain and I don't want to see them suffering anymore. And he's grieved, a parent is grieved when their children go astray. I want to put it this way and train, change that picture from an angry Moses and an angry God to a God grieves. Watch this clip for one minute. parent's love is unlike any other. The love a parent feels for their child begins before they're even born, and it doesn't leave until the parents breathe their last breath. That's why Isaiah asked the question, can a mother forget her little child and not have love for her own son? And yet, even if that should be, I will not forget you. God, our Heavenly Father, expresses His love for us, both in terms of a father's love and a mother's love. Generally, a mother has a much closer attachment for their child because, well, God just wired us that way. We carried the baby inside our wombs for nine months before they were even born. And even adoptive mothers feel this same motherly love for their children. 
Love your children in the same way that God loves you unconditionally. Is that a different picture of God than the world often paints? God loves us that much. He's inviting us like Noah inviting people to get into the ark. It's a loving invitation. Yes, he's upset that people are killing each other, hurting each other, and he doesn't want that, and he's got to put an end to it at some point. There'll be an end to this planet at some point, not long from now, for the same reason. The cup of iniquity is filling. The Israelites, when they were going to the promised land, they could have gone in right away, but they weren't ready. And the text tells us in Exodus also that the cup of iniquity of the rest of the people where they were going to go into their promised land, their cup of iniquity wasn't full. And the cup of iniquity of this planet apparently isn't full yet either. We're not ready. And iniquity as bad as it is, is going to get worse, unfortunately. If you want to know more about this ark that we need to get into just as surely as that ark where we were invited, the people of Noah's they were invited, get in the ark, get in the ark. If you want to know about that ark, see us because we have Bible study lessons that make it clear there's an ark today. There is an ark and it's not on the earth. It's an ark in the heavenly sanctuary. Revelation eleven nineteen tells how it was open and he could see the covenant. It's the ark of the covenant. It's there, it's the same one as was on planet earth. How tragic that people don't pay attention to the ark in heaven with the Ten Commandments inscribed there and the message of the mercy seat above it. He has mercy for everyone who will turn to him. He's longing for people to choose to enter into the ark by faith. And right after that text, of course, Revelation eleven nineteen, it starts chapter 12. And in chapter 12, you see it there. It's the war in heaven. He's telling you the solution. It's come to the ark, come, onto the, come under the covenant. Accept the mercy and love of God and keep his commandments. That's the only way to live. You can't eat the fruit of the tree and expect to get away like Eve and Adam suffered. It's time. Well, let's change a little bit of our focus. All swans, how many say all swans are white? Oh, you're an informed group. In the 17th century, all European historical records said that swans had white feathers. There were no black swans. And to say a black swan is like saying pink elephants fly. It didn't make any sense to anybody back then. But there was a problem because black swans were discovered in Australia. The Cygnus stratus, a large water bird, nomadic, monogamous, and they share re breeding responsibilities between the sexes, the black swan. But there's something else about the black swan. It's the title of the book, Black Swan, the Impact of the Highly Improbable. Nassim Taleb's book, basically the theme is there are events that people think about, but they're so unlikely to happen, you would say, oh, it, it could happen someday, but it couldn't happen to me in our time. He defines a black swan as an event with low probability but it has very high impact, because if it did happen, it would be a big problem. Some of you have heard, probably all of you have heard about the quake in Japan, March 11, 2011, 9.0 more or less on the Richter scale. So they had built, because there had been in this particular village uh, at Ryoshi, uh, they had a tidal wave 100 years ago, and so they built this big 30 foot high wall to keep out any future tidal waves. Because the last time when it came through, it wiped out the village. They believe it killed 90% of the people living there. But it would be dif different this time, they thought. Unfortunately, the water, the tidal wave after that earthquake went over the wall, still destroyed the village. This photo is from uh, CNN on April 1, 2011, right, Oishi, if, however you pronounce that. Well, the 30-foot high wall wasn't high enough. They weren't adequately prepared. Fukushima was the impact there with the nuclear reactor meltdown too. 
It's 2020, and they're still putting in the news about Fukushima. They're still rebuilding it. Now they're moving back in and have made some progress. But can you imagine waiting almost a decade for things to start to get better? Aren't you glad that when this world has a meltdown, it's not going to take Jesus 10 years or 20 years to rebuild it? We rest for a thousand years in heaven. If you haven't, if not familiar with that, let us know. We'd be glad to get your literature about it. But the fact is, when Jesus comes in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, we'll be going home. Can you say praise the Lord for that? Well, what about coronavirus then? Is this a black swan event? Doug Batchelor uh, put out a little, since he's nearby, we might as well share some of his information. Some of you have probably seen his post on Facebook. Well, he refers to this video clip. How many of you have seen it? Wow, you'll probably see it all later. It just came out. So this doctor, doctor, by the way, because I'm, I'm, it's good that I'm not a doctor because I can say these things and I'm not held accountable. If a doctor got up and told you, he'd feel responsible. But I'm just saying what this doctor posted, you can watch it yourself. My short summary of what he taught about it is, since this virus wants to get into your lungs and kill you, particularly if you're old like me, since I almost died from the flu caused pneumonia two years ago, uh, I don't want to get this again. It was a nightmare back then. I uh, lived through it by the grace of God, but this is tough for older people. Anyway, here, here's his short thing. What do you do? Wash your hands a lot. Stay away from people who are coughing and sneezing and wear a mask. If you get a real expensive mask, if there are any left in the world still, uh, then if you can get one of those, that's good. I'd have to shave off my beard. I don't know if I want to do that. Uh, but wear a mask anyway, even if it's a cheap one, because it reminds you, don't touch your face. Well, the coronavirus, uh, Dr. Wes Youngberg. How many know Dr. Wes Youngberg? Okay, how many of you saw his video? Just two. Okay, well, you'll be hearing a lot more about this in the days ahead, I suspect. But uh, he had a lot of, a lot of details. Uh, his video was uh, on the Camarillo, California SDA Church website. He has a lot more details, really a lot of details in there. If you practice all the stuff he says, you live forever, it seems. <laughs> but uh, it's really, really a good presentation. Scary, but good informative and helpful, because fear is not helpful. Faith is helpful, but it should be an informed faith. Well, what's his short verse version is, uh, uh, go to bed and stay there until two days after every symptom is gone. That's a requirement, he said, based on past, uh, he d does all the studies, the details, and it, this is an hour long presentation. And he's got more after that. Anyway, he said, but you can get up for two things. You can get out of bed to take hydrotherapy, contrast showers, such things as that, and to get up to drink a lot of water because you need a lot of water. Anyway, there's a lot of details. That's uh, what the website looks like. Camarillo, Seventh-day Adventist Church, California. And down here, in the video archive, you can find his presentations. So keep that in mind. Cam Morello, SDA Church, video archive. Hopefully it'll still be up and it won't crash because everybody's going there at the same time. Okay, whoops, lost that. Let's see if we can get back to it. There we go. So the impact of the highly improbable, they thought they'd done enough to prepare. Who are we talking about? Matthew 26, verses 36 to 40. We're talking about Peter in Matthew chapter 26. Highly improbable event. Uh, how are we doing in spiritual preparation for these black swan events that are inevitable? Well, Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane. 
said to the disciples, sit here, I'll go pray over there. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, what? Read it with me. My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. How prepared were they for this? Not very well prepared. Jesus needed their company. He's human too, you know, and he needed somebody there with him. And he asked them to pray, be with him, pray with him. Not just for himself, he cared about them. If they didn't pray, they wouldn't be strong enough to deal with what was coming. In verse 39, it says he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed saying, oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. That's how we form a character like Christ, by praying for the mind of Christ through the Holy Spirit living in us, asking moment by moment, day by day, Holy Spirit, please come to me, knowing that you're claiming a promise. Jesus said, if you ask me, you will receive the Holy Spirit. It's not a one-time thing. It's a daily, hourly, moment by moment communication with heaven. Remember the passage in Genesis where we started? The Lord was what? Sorry. He grieved in his heart. Do you see the connection between this and when, when Jesus was in Gethsemane? When Jesus was on the cross? Do you see what it was like? Can you imagine what it was like for this experience to be grieving? So this is the kind of grieving I'm thinking of when, he's, when he has the sorrow of a, of a mother or father for a son. God loves this world, loves you and me with a unconditional love, but that unconditional love can't do away with a commitment to keep on sinning. We have to ask God for power to turn from sin. Oh, why would you die grieved in his heart? He fell on his face and prayed saying, not as I will, but as you will. That has to be the determining factor, the determining choice for you and for me. We have to choose. It's not going to be my will, but God's will that is my priority. No matter how much suffering it is, it's got to be God's will, not my will. How tragic that their attitude was to argue about who was going to be highest in the new kingdom instead of praying for a Micah 6.8 experience. I'll show the old man what is good and what does the Lord require of you. Simple, right? What does he require of you? To do justly, that's keeping the commandments. To love mercy. Mercy, accept his mercy for you and pass it on. And then walk humbly with God, which is the opposite of what the disciples were doing. To argue about who's going to be the greatest. And we're supposed to be praying to be a servant of all. What a tragedy. They were sleeping, and that's why they were in such a mess, because they were sleeping instead of praying and watching with Jesus for an hour. They'd been with Jesus for three and a half years. How long have you been with Jesus? How long have I been with Jesus? My relationship with Jesus is not as strong as it should be, but I thank God it is growing. We all need to be growing by being in prayer, by pressing close to Jesus, by, by asking the Holy Spirit day by day and throughout the day, oh Lord, my mind's wandering again. I'm so focused on all the details of life that I'm not thinking about you at all. I'm doing it all in my own strength and this happens to me all the time. And I have to keep calling on Jesus and asking for his intervention. We have to build relationships with each other too because we need each other. Our congregation, God's people, need each other. We need to form relationships with each other to encourage one another. Hebrews 10, 23 to 25, you're familiar with it. It's, it's how to get ready. We have to get ready for these black swan events. Maybe after walking into a doctor's office and getting a shocking diagnosis when we thought we're doing okay. Maybe when you come home one day and experience what I did 40 years ago and find a note that says, I moved away. Don't try to find me. 
It may be a universal financial meltdown from a massive debt in the U.S. and the world causing the stock market to crash. So we're suddenly broke and unemployed. Now's the time to get ready. Now's the time to have such a close relationship with Jesus that no matter what happens, we say, God, I wish I weren't going through this right now, but not my will, but your will be done. Help me to grow from this experience, grow closer to you, and have more time to serve other people maybe, or some way help somebody else who's suffering. Let's read the text together. Would you read it with me? And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. Is the day approaching? The day of Jesus. But Peter, still there. Even if all forsake you, I'll never. He thought he was fully prepared. I'm not fully prepared, but I'm working on it. How about you? Oh, my. And Jesus said, you'll deny me three times. And Peter says, oh, no, I won't. So said all the disciples. They're in denial about how bad their condition is. Laodicea, are you hearing? Wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. That's our condition. But, praise the Lord, he says what? As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. So count it a blessing for him to tell us our true condition. And then go for the remedy. I counsel thee to buy me gold tried in the fire. White raiment I'll be clothed and you're naked, not naked anymore. And the eye staff. So you can see clearly your condition and the beauty of my character and be captivated by my love. Successfully preparing for these black swan events is critical. I'll just draw on this article from Delbert Baker, who used to be president of Oakwood and now he's somewhere ministering, I think in Africa, I heard last. But from 2011, this is fascinating. Three suggestions. And here I abridged from what he said, but how do you prepare for a black swan? Number one, he says, do the next right thing. Small, manageable tasks. KIS stands for keep it simple. Just, and resist the negative. Focus on that one thing when you're in a crisis. This one thing, one thing at a time. Recognize the danger of going negative when halt. What does halt stand for? When you're hungry, when you're angry, when you're lonely, when you're tired, realize this is not the time to make lifelong decisions. But do the one right thing that you can think of at that moment. Preparation for coronavirus, again, get a mask. You don't touch your face, stay away from other people's air, especially sneezers, sneezers and coughers. And if you have symptoms, go to bed and stay there until two days after the symptoms are gone and do hydrotherapy and fluid. Preparations. There is an important thing to keep in mind about the simple next thing and about following the instructions. Because when I was in the Air Force survival training, we went out camping, they gave us a sleeping bag and uh, very little else and said, you're off, wander out in the mountains. And they said, there's only one rule you have to follow and that is Make sure you drink enough water, you're at high altitude, uh, it's gonna be very dry air, and if you don't drink, you're gonna get very sick and you could die. Okay, so after the first night out, filled my water bottle faithfully, laid it uh, by my sleeping bag, and uh, got up in the morning to be obedient, to drink my water, two problems. Number one, it had, you had to put an iodine tablet in it to keep it from, uh, from any bad viruses and things were in it. But the other thing was, not only did I hate to taste it, it, terrible taste, but the other thing was, it had frozen during the night. So I said, how am I gonna drink this? It's frozen. So I started off with the crew and we wandered off into the mountains and walked all day, very vigorous time, and get back. We got back at night and went to bed, crawled into my bed, into my sleeping bag, and I got sick. I got really sick. I thought I was going to die, and I was laying there thinking, I'm going to die here in this, out in the middle of nowhere in my sleeping bag. What's wrong? Dehydrated. The instructor said, you're going to die if you don't drink. 
And I didn't drink anything all day because my water was frozen. I was so sick, I got out of my sleeping bag, I was on my hands and knees, and I crawled about 100 yards until I got to where the creek was, and I slid down the bank, put my face in the water, and drank 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 until I could hold no more water. Then I laid over on my back and thought, well, I did what I'm supposed to do. Hopefully I won't die. And after a while, I got enough strength where I could crawl back up the hill and over to my sleeping bag and crawl in. And I woke up in the morning. Hallelujah. <laughs> that was tough. Listen to your instructors and use water. Lots of water. Well, Peter should have watched and prayed. Praying without ceasing. Repeat Bible promises, right? Nothing can separate us from the love of God. No one, if we, unless we let them distract us. All things work together. They're not all good things that happen. That's our toughening process. We go through it on this planet. But all things ultimately work out for good. Second point, surrender to God's will, but don't give up. This is a paradox, right? There's a fear of death and it can paralyze us. Survivors realize they may die, like I in a sleeping bag. But persevere anyway. Get out of the sleeping bag and do what you're supposed to. Surrender, but don't give up. Revelation 14, 12. Read it with me. This is very important. Here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. This is not complicated. Being a believer in Christ and a follower of the Bible is not complicated. Persevere with faith in Jesus and keeping the commandments of God. Revelation 12, 11. Read it with me too. And they overcame him because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life even when faced with death. Three things. We can remember that many things. It's not complicated. The blood of Jesus cleanses us. The Holy Spirit empowers us. So number three is develop the core values you can live by before you need it. What are the core values? Probably the primary one, love God, love your neighbor. And it's summed up in the Ten Commandments. The first four commandments tell how to express love for God. The last six tell how to express love for your neighbor. That's it. Make it simple. But we, f we fall. We're weak. Jesus told us that, right? He said the Spirit is indeed is willing. This is on the same thing with Peter and the disciples. The Spirit indeed is willing. I'm glad you have the idea that you want to do it. But the flesh is weak. And praise the Lord that what? He loves us anyway. Oh, hallelujah. Otherwise, we'd all be gone, goners. But God is so good to us. You've got to hear this. This is a core values found in Religious News Service, March 16, 2011. Adventists grow as other churches decline. I'll read the quote from them. Uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is growing because its members live what they claim to believe. So here's what he, what he said. Rest on the Sabbath, heed Old Testament dietary codes, be ready for Jesus to return at any moment. If these practices sound quaint or antiquated, think again. They're the hallmarks of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, the fastest growing Christian denomination in North America. Is that still true in 2020? I have no idea. This was written back in 2011. But if it isn't true today, whose fault is it? Well, it's the fault of the world that's drifting farther and farther away from God and the truth. And is it possible that we don't honor these same teachings and follow them as carefully as we should? Resting on the Sabbath, heeding the Old Testament dietary codes, be ready for Jesus to return. And we could add several more. We have 28 fundamental beliefs, but very simply, the Ten Commandments and the faith in Jesus, praying for the Holy Spirit. Faithfulness. Are we prepared for the black swan? Of all people, we should be. We should be preparing because we know what most people don't. The greatest black swan event ever. Interruption. We interrupt this program for an announcement. Jesus is coming. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. 
So are we prepared for the black swan from my favorite author, Outside the Scripture, page 58, the book Steps to Christ? Who has the heart? With whom are our thoughts? Who has our warmest affections and our best energies? What's your answer? Is it Jesus or something or someone or else? It should be Jesus. And it will be if we focus our attention on him. Prepared for the black swan, if we are Christ's, our thoughts are with him and our sweetest thoughts are of him. All we have and are is consecrated to him. We long to bear his image, breathe his spirit, do his will, and please who? Please him, please Jesus in all things. This is our day. We can recommit our lives to that. Jesus has our heart, our mind, and everything.